Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Oops. Just get all my stuff together here. All right. We are on the 12th lesson of this quarter, studying in the book of Psalms. And you know me, I always like to start with prayer requests or praise reports. Um, I write them on the start of the next lesson, so I remember to thank God, pray about them during the next week. So, anyone have a... Sister Galia. <laughs> Amen. All right. Anyone else? Great. My mama is here. And it's good to see you. <laughs> so happy to be here. We're glad to have you. I know Ronnie is thrilled. <laughs> All right. I have a praise. It's spring break. And I get to go see my mother and father over break. So, my mother will be celebrating her 95th birthday uh, while I'm there. So I just praise God for all the years I've had with them. Brother Luxon? Yes, yes. Um, at my school, we have m many students who are in the foster care system. And it's not always a stable life for them. I mean, I've had students, I have students who have not been here at the beginning of the year, were here, now they're gone already. So that means they're probably in their third home this school year. And even if they've been adopted and came from a background that was not good for them, they always feel shunned. Mm. I found that in speaking to several of them, and it breaks your heart if you pray for them. Amen. Amen. Any other prayer requests or praise reports before we start? Then let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. You see our, you heard our prayer requests. We know that you are always there, caring for, watching, wooing those who we sometimes forget or neglect. So we lift up the youth in our community. We lift up those in the foster care system, those who are about to age out of it. We know that life is often uncertain for them. Father, I, I pray for blessings on Luxus as he is working on what I believe you are leading him to, to, to work with those who are aging out of the foster care system. Father, we praise you for Ronnie's mother being with us and for spring break and for all of the many blessings you provide. Now we ask as we open your word and open our Sabbath school lessons that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts as well, open our minds, so that we can not only learn something, but live something as a result. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right. So lesson 12 is entitled, Worship That Never Ends. Um, even the sound of it is just beautiful. <laughs> Worship That Never Ends. I am going to go through the lesson slightly differently. So if I miss something that you want, a point that struck you and you want to bring out, just raise your hand. Or when I pause, you know, that 
will be an opportunity, but there's no way we can fully cover everything. I mean, we're almost at the end of the quarterly, and there's no way we could cover every psalm. And even within our lessons, there's just so much. But our lesson memory text is uh, Psalm 104, 33. It says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Amen. Oh. Had a moment of panic there. All right. So on Sabbath afternoon, in the last paragraph, there is some discussion of communal worship versus individual worship. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I'm going to read what it says there, make a little analogy. But our focus is simply true worship. Mm -hmm. So it says on the third paragraph, Praising the Lord in the congregation is perceived as ideal worship. This does not mean that the prayer and praise of the individual in Israel assume a secondary meaning. By contrast, the individual's worship of God feeds the communal worship with renewed praise, while in turn, individual worship develops its fullest potential in close relationship with the community. So when I read that, I thought about choirs. Um, for a while, our church had a little choir. I love to sing. <laughs> My gift is mass choir, where there are enough people to drown me out, but I just love to sing. And so I joined the choir, and I really enjoyed it. Um, but when you're in a choir, if the only time you ever practiced your part was when the choir was rehearsing together, you would never learn it fully. There needs to be choir, you need to, like, we were singing the Hallelujah Chorus. And so at home, I would listen to, I sing tenor, I listen to the YouTube tenor part to learn it, and then I would sing still with YouTube when the choir was singing the whole thing, I'd sing my tenor part. But still, it wasn't the same as when I came to church to practice with the choir. But if I hadn't done my practice at home, my practice with the choir as a whole would have been lacking. And at home, I you know, would think about what the words meant. And when I came to choir rehearsal, we would share. Our choir director, he was very good about that. He was very big on us thinking of the words as we sang. So we would share. We would share our experiences at home, having thought about it, and we would bring that to the group. And worship is like that. Without a home, an individual experience of worship, your group worship is missing something. And if all you do is worship at home, then you have missed out on the communal benefits. All right. Any thoughts on that? That's all I wanted to say about that. All right. So I am going to jump over to Tuesday. Our focus is um, insights we can get from the Psalms on worship. So first, I guess I'm going to jump to Wednesday for just a bit. The top of the first paragraph on Wednesday, if we talk about what is worship, what worship includes, it says, worship includes singing to the Lord. And there's the text. Praising his, praising his name, proclaiming his goodness and greatness, and bringing gifts to his temple. In addition to these familiar traits of worship, Psalm 96 highlights one not so obvious aspect of worship, the evangelical dimension in proclaiming the Lord's kingdom to other people. So I'll go into that a little bit more later, but right now, let's just keep in mind, worship is multifaceted. Right. So, Tuesday, the question 
The title is a question. It is Psalm 15, verse 1. So I invite you to turn to Psalm 15, and we'll look at that question. Psalm 15, verse 1. And it's from the uh, King, New King James Version. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? So the first point that I want to make is that true worship involves a pure heart. All right? So let's look for biblical evidence. Psalm 15, verses, it's a short psalm. Verses 1 through 5. Can I get a volunteer to read that for me? All right. Thank you, sister. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Who does not slander with his tongue and does, not, and does no evil to his neighbor? Not take up a reproach against his friend. He whose hides a vile person is despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who swear to his own heart and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against innocence. He who does this thing shall be moved. Amen. Amen. So there's a whole list there. Who can abide in your temple? And when we say abide in his temple, let's understand we mean who can be in your presence. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about who can show up at church. When we talk about the sanctuary, we're not talking necessarily just the building. The building matters because God is here. So who can abide in his presence? Walk uprightly. <coughs> work righteousness. Speak the truth. Don't slander or do evil to your neighbors. Despise evil people. I can't even read my own writing. <laughs> um, honor those who fear the Lord. Keep his word. Don't take advantage of people charging interest on things. Don't take bribes. Right? So it says in Tuesday's lesson... The answer given in the psalm is the summary of the requirements already given in God's law and the prophets. The ones whose actions and character are a reflection of God. Those who walk in his footsteps. Those who walk in his footsteps. Because God is holy. In order for us to abide in his presence, we must be holy. Which, at first glance, sounds like a daunting task. Like, oh, it's impossible. But there's a but, praise God, in there. We'll get there. Let's look at the next question in that. It says, what does it mean to be holy? So we have some other texts. Let's look at Psalm 24. What does it mean to be holy? And again, the best place to go for answers is always the Bible. Right? Because there are churches that call themselves Holiness Church. And it's not a bad name. As long as you're defining holiness from Scripture. All right, Psalm 24. Let's just look at verses 3 through 6. You got that, Ronnie? Yes. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, say Amen. 
I'm going to read one more, and then we're going to talk about them. And it's Psalm 101, verses 1 through 3. 101, 1 through 3. It says, I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. So, to be holy involves be having a perfect heart. Clean hands. Yes. And being honest. Mm -hmm. Psalm 15. Yeah, exactly. Right? It says, a perfect heart, I'm reading in Thursday, uh, Tuesday, a perfect heart is the worshiper's greatest quality before God. The Hebrew, tamim, perfect, conveys the notion of completeness and wholeness. A perfect vine is whole, undamaged, and healthy. Then it says a little later, oh, it says, animals offered as sacrifices had to be tamin or without blemish. Perfect speech, talking about what you said, is entirely truthful. A perfect heart, thus, is a pure heart, a heart of integrity. It seeks God and is restored by God's forgiveness. Now, um, I was shared with my small group, uh, I can't remember, I think it was this last time. It might have been the time before. Sometimes, you know, God is so good to us, he doesn't show us all of our issues at the same time. Because then we'd be overwhelmed and, like, he reveals, he helps us overcome, he reveals something else. I didn't realize, it didn't dawn on me that some behavior I was doing was wrong until this year. And, you know, sometimes it's because something is so, like, accepted in your family that you never even think about it. So I'll share with you this kind of silly thing. But my father gets a lot of robocalls. I mean, my father's 90 years old now. And he, uh, he it's, like, ingrained in him to answer his phone. He can't just ignore it. We're, not, we're like, Daddy, just don't... Because we tried to teach him how to block the calls, but he's technolo technologically challenged. <laughs> but like, it's like he hears the phone ring, and it's just like, you see, he wants to answer it so badly. It's no one he recognizes, but he still wants to answer it. So when my brother and I were there last year, um, we would take turns when we didn't just block it. Sometimes we would answer it, because, in our, because we had this little thing that we thought was funny. Like my brother would answer, and he would say, we, my parents live in Alabama, so he would answer and he would say, Alabama State uh, Correctional Institute, what is the prisoner number that you wish to contact? <laughs> right? And I, when I would answer, I would just like make up a language. Like I spoke some other language that they didn't know. Yeah, I would be like, can you make up a lab, Yeah. Anyway, but this year, it dawned on me in my time with the Lord, and that's why we need to be in the Word. God was not pleased with that. Now, we, just, we never thought anything of it, right? Oh, funny, whatever, you know, silly way to get rid of people. But no, it, it, was, it was pretense. And pretense is lying. And lying is wrong to the Lord. You know, so I had to repent of that. And then I thought, you know, I don't, I can say something to them about God. That might make them hang up even for, in quicker, but hey, I could say something to them about the Lord. I'm sorry, you've reached the wrong number, but if you're in need of prayer, I'm happy to pray with you. Right? So, sometimes we don't realize what we're doing is not pleasing to God. But God will eventually reveal that to us. 
And if our desire is to have a pure heart and holy hands, we will repent and change. So it says in that same lesson toward the bottom, it says, um, well, what it said that a pure heart seeks God and is restored by God's forgiveness. So, in order to be forgiven, what has to come before forgiveness? Repentance. repentance. True repentance. True repentance. I cannot abide in the presence of the Lord if I am not truly repentant. And here's the beauty of God. I can't even repent on my own. I can't even initiate it. But God initiates it for me. In uh, Steps to Christ, it says on page 22, first on page 22, it says, repentance includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in the life. Mm -hmm. We must be honest with ourselves. And we can't even be. The heart is, you know, deceitful, exceedingly wicked. Who can know it? Then the Bible says, I, the Lord, search the heart. So then on page 20. Six, it says, the Bible does not teach that the sinner must repent before he can heed the invitation of Christ. It is the virtue that goes forth from Christ that leads to genuine repentance. We can no more repent without the spirit of Christ to awaken the conscience than we can be pardoned without Christ. The only way I could repent for that foolish way that I talked on the phone was that the Holy Spirit brought it to my conscience that it was wrong. Right? I didn't think that up on my own because I was thinking it was great all those years. It was funny. But the Holy Spirit brought that to my conscience. And that's what led me to repentance. Right? And by God's grace, I'm never going to act that way on the phone again. Because God also gives you a replacement. That's what I love about God. He gave me replacement that I can say. I don't have to say something foolish to them. I can say something sincere about the Lord. Who knows? One of those people might actually be interested. All right. Um, I have another little quote to read. Let's see. In um, Revelation, when it talks about the seal of God, where is the seal of God? Where is it on the body? Where is it? On our forehead, right? Because, God, and, and for the mark of the beast, it can be on your forehead or your hand. Because the mark of the beast can simply be compliance, right? I'm doing. I don't necessarily believe but I'm going along with it because I don't want that other consequence. But God does not have a seal on anybody's hand. It's always on the forehead, meaning it's always, he wants our heart. He wants our mind. He wants us to do it because we believe and trust him. Not because we're trying to get something out of it or just go along. That's true, true repentance, true obedience. All right. Any comments on that? Sometimes people do that out of fear. Sometimes people do that. Exactly. Out of fear. Now, in um, Monday's lesson, it talks about singing a new song. I want to talk about that in each part that I do today. So in um, Who Can Abide in the Temple? True Repentance Requires a Pure Heart. When you have a pure heart, you sing a new song. You sing a new song when your heart is different. Um, 
and people notice. Yes. Yes. And it establishes in your conscience like right from wrong, and that's stronger. So next time that comes around, you're not going to do it. Like, avoid doing it. Yes, and Sister White talks about seeing the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Right? When you start to see where you didn't see before, the sinfulness, the exceeding sinfulness of sin, you see how it harms, you see how it hurts. Um, I thought before with this little incident that it was just fun, but lying hurts people, mm -hmm. right? And truth helps, right? You've reached the wrong number, but if you are in need of prayer, I am happy to pray with you. That's going to be my new thing, right? Yes. It makes you proactive, yes. right? It makes you proactive. All right. Any other comments on that? Comments? Yes. Yeah, I think sometimes when we say we repent, we are not truly repenting. Mm. What we fear is the consequence mm. of what we do. Uh, this, today's lesson is letting us know that it's not, it, we have to repent because we love the Lord. Amen. We, it, that's it's the only thing that can really bring true repentance. And also I want to comment that worship that never hand. Yes. The worship that never hand is when we have a true and genuine relationship with God. That's why I will see my brother as my brother. Amen. I will see my sister as my sister. And we can all come in harmony with God. Right, and I think it's worship that never ends is a worship that is constantly seeking God, right? It's not a worship that I just do once a week, right? Because worship, if I worship him with my whole heart, then that means I'm worshiping him while I'm at work, right? I'm worshiping him when I'm at the grocery store, you know. But what you said about true repentance, you know, my students all the time, when I call them out for something, I'm sorry, Miss Wilson. And I always say to them, it's not enough to tell me you're sorry. You need to show me by not doing it anymore. Yes. Right? You know, because what you're, because what, like you said, many of them are just sorry that I caught them. <laughs> right? They're sorry because they have lunch detention. But they're not really sorry that they said whatever they said or acted the way they acted. Because that true sorrow for sin and the turning away comes from the heart. You know, sometimes I try and throw their mothers in there. You know, I say to this one boy, I say, Your mother came in here and cried. If my mother came in here and cried, I would change. Because I don't want to hurt my mother like that. If you don't want to hurt your mother like that again, you need to change. But just think about that, not just your loved one, but God. I think of Joseph every time. Because Joseph with, uh, Pot uh, with uh, Potiphar's wife said, not, he said, you know, your father trusts me, with, I mean, your husband trusts me with whatever. But then he said, how can I do this sin against God? Because that's who he never wanted to hurt above any other. And if we actually had that spirit all the time, just imagine. That's, that's my prayer. Lord, I, help me to realize that these behaviors, how, what they do to you. Yes. you're doing 
And that really hurts my feelings. I want you to think before you do things. Mm. All right. Now we're going to talk about, we said true worship involves a pure heart. True worship is also worship of every aspect of God. And what I mean by that is sometimes um, some people worship God the creator, right? which is not bad. I mean, God is our creator. We should worship him as our creator. But that's how, so, so they don't hurt the earth, right? They, they say, let's take care of the planet because God is our creator. We, they were stewards of it. But then what about other things, right? God is also sovereign, the sovereign ruler. That means obedience to him in all aspects. But if you only worship him as creator, acknowledging that he made the world, then your worship is incomplete. So let's look at um, Psalm 96 and identify some different aspects of God. Psalm 96. So, verses 1 and 2 say, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. What aspect of God is revealed there? That he cares. That he cares. That he loves and he's trying to have us follow in his footsteps. That he loves us. But is it God as creator? Where? Yes. From the beginning, sing the song and the song sing to the Lord all the earth. It doesn't say he made the earth, it just says sing earth. What aspect of God is in verses 1 and 2? Encouraging all his creatures to worship him. Look at verse 2. What aspect of God is there? So God as what? Come on, class. Savior. God as Savior. Right? And there are some who only worship him as Savior. Right? I thank God I'm saved. And some of them say, once saved, always saved. Right? They worship God as Savior only and even have a false understanding of what that means. All right. Now let's look at verse 5. Um, is that the verse I want? Yes. Verse 5. It says, well, I'll go to verse 4. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. God is what? What aspect? It's okay to be wrong because it just means you're thinking. I take any thinking. God is creator. He made all the heavens, right? God as creator. So we have God as savior, God as creator. Let's look at verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. I'm just going to stop right there. What about that part, the Lord reigns? God as what? God as king. king. God as king. So we have God as savior, creator, king. Then let's look at verse... 13. Well, I'm going to read 11 through 13. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. 
Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. God as? God, don't be afraid. Say it loud. God as? Judge. God as judge. Savior, creator, king, judge. Um, you can ex extrapolate from creator and savior, redeemer. Right? Right? He's our and there's all sorts of others. We could look in other places for it. But here we identify a certain definite ones. When we worship God, true worship involves all of those things. Right? We should worship him as judge. Look. Look at verses 11 and 12. They're happy he's the judge. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad because he's coming to judge. The righteous should not fear God as judge. They should look forward to it because he is going to vindicate them. Amen. Right? Yes. So we worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. Yes. Right? When you say that, what do you mean, Ronnie? Amen. Amen. So notice this Psalm 96 starts out, sing to the Lord a new song. When you worship him in all of his aspects, there's a new song. Because you're recognizing all these things about him. You're seeing him working in all these ways in your life. Right? You are not with his help, upset when things are unfair at your job because you recognize that one day he will judge the world in righteousness and you are content to trust him and not get all bent out of shape when the evil prosper. When you recognize him as king, then all those other things that were important to you are secondary if you worship him as king, right? The glory, you're not looking for glory to yourself. One of my favorite songs is, uh, King of my life, I crown you now. Thine shall the glory be, right? You're not looking to get all that recognition anymore because you recognize it's all him. When you recognize him as creator, you are not your own. Redeemer, you are bought with a price. He's your savior. When you worship him in all those ways, there's a fullness and there's a new song that you sing. I'll take Sister Galia, then Brother Luxon, and then Sister Dorcas. Well, what comes to me is that we couldn't even function in any way, shape, or form if we don't understand how he meant omniscient God is and how much he loves us. Amen. And when we spend enough time <clears throat> with the Lord, then we'll be able to see the attributes that you know that you have outlined. And then that will help us not to focus on the other gods because they don't have these attributes Amen. that God has. And that part where he said, when we spend enough time, right? In my five-minute prayer, I'm never going to come to these things. In that rush, you know, I made a commitment uh, to get up even earlier. I was like, Lord, 445, that's not early enough. <laughs> and apparently he said no. Because while I then had time for the study I was doing, my prayer time was still not, I didn't have that time in the morning. So I was like, okay, Lord, yes, we will set the alarm even earlier. And so this week I've been getting up earlier. 
and my prayer time benefits as a result. And, you know, it doesn't change my work through the day. Um, God gives you the strength to do. I go to bed earlier because the otherwise would just be foolish. Sister Dorcas. Yeah, I just want to comment on uh, acknowledging God as a judge. Yes. It's not about fear, but it's about it's not about fear that or tremble that oh it's going to condemn us. Right. But it's about that it's going to be fair to us that it's not going to be partial. We live in the world where things go in the wrong way. But when he is the judge, is the one to vindicate us. So saying to God a new son also that should even help us to realize that every morning we should give glory to him yes. with a songs of praise and appreciate his leadership in our life. And when we have that time to dwell on God as the judge, we realize, um, I've been listening to some sermons on that recently, we realize God the Father is the presiding judge. Jesus is the 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 actual advocate. working judge. I can't remember the word was for it. What is it? Advocate. He's our advocate too, but he's also our judge. He's our advocate, right? He's the true and faithful witness. When we spend time thinking about all those things, why would we fear the judgment? Right? All right. Got one more t uh, thing to cover. So we've said true worship involves a pure heart. True worship involves every aspect of who God is. And true worship includes evangelism. The lesson brings this out um, on Wednesday, where it says, and I read that a little earlier, Psalm 96 highlights one not so obvious aspect of worship, the evangelism dimension in proclaiming the Lord's kingdom to other peoples. And the lesson brings out the parallel between the 96th Psalm and Revelation 14, 6 through 6 and 7. So first, let's look at Revelation 14. Some of us know it by heart. Revelation 14, 6 says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Amen. So, that proclamation... Fear God, give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment has come. In Psalm 96, verse 2, Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. And then we read down in verse 13, For He is coming, for He is coming to judge the earth. Our new song that we're singing includes singing that song to those who don't know the Lord. Evangelism. Singing it with our changed lives. Right? Our lives should sing that new song to them. But also singing it, you know, sometimes we just hum the tune. And that's fine. That's us living our lives. But sometimes we need to actually sing the lyrics and actually say words to people. Yesterday, you know, there, my coworker beside me is a Buddhist. And he was saying something about how we all just use different names for God. Well, that was what he said. I didn't, I didn't comment on that yesterday, but he was saying something and I said to him, but God is calling us to be better than whatever. Whatever the thing was that he was upset about. I mean, I was probably upset about it too. But God is calling us to be better than that, right? To a higher level. 
Sometimes we need to say the words and not just, not just. We need to live them, certainly. But sometimes we need to explain as well. It's not enough for my neighbor to see me carrying my Bible. I need to actually share the truths from the Bible with them. That new song has to actually be heard by my neighbors. Right? I need to actually offer to pray for them when they tell me their father is in the hospital sick. Pray with them when they tell me things like that. Not just go home and pray for them. Comments? Yes. Well, you have mentioned some of the things but as I was thinking about the evangelists, uh, a question came to mind. What is evangelism? I'm not asking for the definition of the word. You're asking what is evangelism, but you don't want us to give a definition? You want, you want us to say what it looks like? Precisely. Okay. Yes. I would say a new song of deliverance. It's a new song of deliverance of what God has done in our lives, and we are... So what does it look like? Of the person that I, uh, that I am not anymore. Amen. So it looks like a changed life. Yes. So that's one thing it looks like. Amen. A changed life. Because yes. that can proclaim. Yeah. It also, for me, first thing it looks like for me, because my group knows already, I'm not that people in myself, without God, I'm not that people interested. I really am not, uh, you know, about their lives. Oh, whatever. You know, that's too bad. You know, get over it. But this is what evangelism looks like in my life. I actually took an interest in my co-workers' health beyond just, oh, I hope they get better. I actually stopped and had a long conversation with her about it. I actually pointed out something I was reading in Acts of the Apostles about suffering and trials and how the Lord never brings anything to us that He is not going to use for our good. That to me is what evangelism looks like. It's that your life is changed to the point where you actually interact with other people differently in a way that glorifies God. Amen. So, so then it it's more than calling people or calling friends uh, who have not uh, developed a relationship with Christ to an evangelistic meeting and uh, have somebody talk to them. But it's me talking to them in the way that I live. I, wherever I work, on a one-to-one, -one, uh, you know, uh, one-to-one, so it's that, it's, it's, it's the inviting and all that too, and more. It's that and more. And the more you have been changed by God and they can see that, the more likely they are to respond to any invitation, right? My coworker that I took that time with is far more likely now to listen to me the next time. And I'm, trust me, that was nothing but God because most, I told you, me of, of myself, even this year with my students, I noticed far more about them than I used to, right? Like someone else would say, you know, that kid wears the same shirt like three times a week. I never noticed. But now I'm noticing things about them. And I'm commenting, not like you're wearing the same shirt three times. But, oh, is that, is that a new sweatshirt? In the past, I would have never noticed that. That is the Holy Spirit actually making me care about people more, not just care about teaching. All right, comment? I just, wanted, I just wrote some notes as I was studying this morning. So for me, it's being saved and rescued and pardoned and healed of heart is the experience. And then this comes with appreciation and I have a new song of deliverance within me and this is by turning my sinful life over to Jesus and asking him for help for a new life with him and I become a a new, and I have a new song. Amen. And I'm going to put Ronnie's mom on the spot. 
Well, not really on the spot. It's really Ronnie on the spot. <laughs> I'm willing to, if I was a betting person, bet that you have seen changes in Ronnie from what she used to be. Amen. Amen. That's evangelism right there. Right? That new song that we sing and we share with others. Amen. Any comments before we stop? All right. Well, I appreciate everybody's participation. Oh, Sister Galia, go for it. Sometimes you don't realize it. Sometimes God just speaks through you, and then you realize what you say. Amen. And you say, oh, thank you, Lord. Yes, because you realize it wasn't you. Yeah, it's all. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you so much that you are our creator, our savior, our redeemer, the righteous judge, our king. We thank you that you create a clean heart in us. You purify us. You lead us to repentance. Your grace empowers us to live lives that are pleasing to you. Father, we ask that you help us to sing that new song, the song of what you have done in us and for us, and that what you are doing through us. Help us to sing that song to our families, to our friends, to our co-workers, to our neighbors, so that when Jesus comes again, we will be among a mighty throng, welcoming him, saying, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. Now bless us as we continue our worship in your house today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Pray that you were blessed with Sabbath school as I was. Praise the Lord. For a special feature today, we're going to have a, a special story. It's a mission story from uh, what's been going on in Africa. So today we have the privilege of having our sister and brother here named Kuda and Paul. So thank you, sister and brother, for sharing what you are going to share this morning with us. In the mission story from Africa. Okay, God bless you. Thank you. Good morning, Beaumont Church. I like to talk when I'm like this. So let me let me practice how to do this. Okay, good, it's working. So my name is Kuda, like I said, and this is my husband. I go to a different church. I'm a nurse. He works at Loma Linda University. So. I'm going to uh, say it very briefly uh, what our project what our project is. I'm going to talk about uh, our trust that we started that works. Uh, it we we uh, sponsor orphans in Africa. So in Zimbabwe, Africa is called Tari Romanashe, which means hope in God. Okay. So I'm still trying to figure this out. Is it like this? Okay, like that. I think I figured it out. So one day when I was on my off day, I love to watch uh, evangelistic uh, uh, programs. So one day I was watching, and then if you uh, one person that watches those things, once in a while they bring pictures that show things like that. And whenever they brought children, 
suffering like that, I would cry. I would cry always. And then one day, about seven days ago, I was doing the same thing, watching that same story. I was crying. And then somehow I heard something that says, how long are you going to keep on crying and not do anything about it? If that wasn't the first time that uh, I felt God has spoken to me about that. Many, many years ago, I had read that quotation from Ellen White. It says, many a father who has died in the faith, resting upon the eternal promise of God, he has left his loved ones in full trust that the Lord would care for them. And how does the Lord provide for the bereaved ones? God does not come down from heaven to take care of the orphans. God uses people like you and me to take care of those bereaved ones. So that's why each time I watched that program, tears came to my eyes because I knew God had told me something before and I wasn't doing it. So what did I do? I started telling God, you know, I cannot, I cannot do much and then Somehow, that quotation came to me, if you can't feed a hundred people, just feed one. So I felt like God had told me, Kuda, if you cannot feed a hundred people, just minister to one person. So this is how we started our trust. So what we do, uh, in six years ago, we started, um, I just started, I'm, I am from Africa, so I started talking to my mom. I said, can you find me 12 or 10 orphans that we can sponsor? That's all we can do. I mean, for now, sending them to school. Why education? Because uh, if you give a man fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Education in Zimbabwe is not free. So if someone does not have, if the parents are poor, they don't have the money, your kid will not go to school. So that's why it was important. Education helps to prevent child marriages and teenage pregnancies. And then it keeps kids out of drugs and, and uh, crimes. And then uh, it just empowers an individual to read and write. So this is how our trust started. So we started uh, in 2019. We sponsor tuition for the school year. We sponsor school supplies. We sponsor them with school uniforms, hygiene products for the girls, and we buy them groceries and toiletries. So we have seen a steady growth. Over the years, 2019, we only had 28 kids. 2020, 28 kids. 2021, 35. And remember, this is just our family and a few friends of ours that we are doing that. This year, we sponsored 76 students and three college students. This is how we do it. We, uh, fund, we get some money from friends and co-workers and all that, and then we go to Africa. This was our, our trip in Africa. We go buy groceries for the kids, and then we work together with the kids. We put the things together um, so that we, 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 we invite them to my mother's place where we bring them, we give them those kids. So this was our first, our very first set of kids, 12 kids that we had in 2019. I was so happy. I felt like God was now using me to accomplish, and my husband was just got on board just like that, with that. So I'm so thankful for that. This was in year two. This was my first trip to Africa to meet those kids. This was in my mom's living room. I was so excited to meet these kids. Meeting these kids, you see uh, how vulnerable they are, and the, they were so happy, and uh, I was so excited about that. This is year two, again, again, so what we do, we bring the kids to my mom's house, we give them their groceries, we have part, a party for them, so this is our year two. This is me connecting with one of, the, one of the kids. They come to me, they share stories, I love to hear those stories, and uh, it really uh, helps me to get to know those kids more. This was year three, the year of COVID. When it was COVID time, I thought, oh, maybe this is, this is it. This is the end. But God had something in plan. So this year, I wasn't able to go there, but we were able to send letters to those kids, and we still sponsored them. We still sent them to school. We, sent, we still bought them some school uniforms. This was year four, again, COVID year, but I was able to go now this time for our fourth year for that. This was me outside my mom's house and sitting with those kids. This is, we always have a party for the kids every year. 
This was year five. You see how the group is, is getting bigger and bigger. And uh, this year, my husband joined me. And after that, he has never stopped. So it's now a family thing. And then this is year, year five. Some of the, the, the girls that we sponsored, one of the girls brought, she, had a, she was a pre, uh, teenage mom. So she brought those, uh, that baby to the party. But it was, it, it was good. And then year five, another more pictures of us with the kids. This is now year six. This is this year. You see how, the big, how big a crowd was? Is, and now it's a family thing. My husband and our daughter, who is like 13 years old, is also jumped in, in and uh, is now joining us too. And um, this is like more pictures. With, with, so when the kids come to my mom's house, we have a party and their guardians bring them there. And those are some of the guardians when we are feeding them. And then we, uh, we also pre present uh, hygiene products to the girls. Uh, some of them actually, during that, their time, they are not able to go to school because they don't have the things to use. So this is an opportunity that we had to, every year we go and give them. We also bring them Christmas presents. This is not just like feeding them materially, but we also have uh, devotion for them. And this, that, that year we gave them a book that my husband uh, and my son wrote. So that was part of their Christmas gift. So we are also... Uh, tending to their spiritual needs in addition to their uh, material needs. I also love to do home visits when I go there. So one of the students didn't come, so <clears throat> I was carrying his bag with, of stuff, uh, moving towards their compound there. So that's one of the things that we love to do. More home visits this year. I got a lot of clothes to take to the, uh, to the kids, and that was one of the... The, the places that I, I was distributing the kids, the, the clothes to the kids. And you see, you see how they are happy? I always come back with like a bag or a dish of fruits. Those, it was season of the mangoes. So that girl is so happy and so excited. And she's giving me some mangoes. Uh, some of the before and after picture, this family, this was that, the time before we met them. And now that is the after we took them into our program and uh, we started sponsoring them. This is also another uh, story where that uh, grandmother has all those um, grandkids. They're not going to school when we met them, but after that now, look at those boys excited, putting on new school, uh, shoes, and what we think is not a big deal, just having a new pair of school shoes means a lot to those kids. Um, this is... Uh, in year five, when they just broke up, the good thing is when we give these things to them, we emphasize to them that it is Jesus who has remembered you through someone to sponsor you. So they always give back glory to God. It is never about us. It is about Jesus. So I don't think it's, it's, it's playing, but uh, if it was playing, you could hear them. Is it? Okay. Maybe I can just, I, it doesn't, doesn't seem to have a sound. I'm only left with a minute here, so let's move on. So what, uh, this was a very short presentation, but what I want us to get from our story is that if God has placed a burden in your heart, act on it now. You don't have to be qualified because God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. That is what I feel. And God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above what we can ever think or dream of. In my dream, I only wanted 10 kids to send to school. But God, through his mercy, now we have 76 kids and three kids going to university. I could have never thought about that. Finally, where God leads, he provides. God will never send you to, get, to do something that you will not pay for. So this is our story for this morning. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sister Kuda and Brother Paul. That's an amazing story, how God just impressed you to do that. It just takes one person to then the hearts of